Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word. So I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. going to take a page from the book of Genesis. I'm not going to let you stand for so long. I know you've been standing for quite some time, but give me a few more minutes just to read to you this beautiful verse from the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 to 9. It says that when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water to the earth. And there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed the breath of life. Everybody take a deep breath. That's the breath of life. He breathed that life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. And then in verse 8 it says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he placed the man he had made. And the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground trees that were beautiful and that produced fruit and in the middle of the garden everybody say in the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil i want to give you right now our big message and i pray that you can preach this to somebody standing next to you our message is for somebody who's been wondering is it enough that i have the money that i have in my pocket are my savings enough? Are my investments enough? And I came to announce to somebody here today. Are you ready for this? Say, I'm ready. You have more than enough. You have more than enough. Have you ever, let me, you know, build the foundation of our talk today. Have you ever asked that question in your life? Maybe at one point in your life, you've been struggling with your finances, you've been struggling with your relationships, and have you ever asked your, this question, is this enough? Have you? Or, or maybe that's just me. Have you ever wondered, is this enough? You know, I come across that question in different moments of my day. Like for instance, I'm driving through uh, Skyway 3 for instance. And then all of a sudden, I get so worried because my RFID balance might not be enough. So I have to ask myself, is it enough? You ever wonder things about things like that? Or maybe some parents here who are almost ready to retire, but then your child is about to go into medical school, and then you begin to wonder, are my savings enough? Are my investments enough? You ever come into that place, or am I just talking about myself? Raise your hand if you feel like that sometimes. Like, am I enough? In this relationship that I'm about to enter, is this enough? And I can certainly attest to the fact that this is where the enemy often gets us. When he wants you to think that it's not enough that God is for you and that he is with you. 
And this is the part that we've just read in the book of Genesis because you see, it's so interesting. Walk with me for a moment. It's so interesting how, you know, Jesus, who was the Son of God, came in the living form, living flesh. You would somehow assume like, you know, the Son of God would come you know, wearing luxurious items, branded clothes, like would live in a palace with a thousand servants. I mean, he, after all, he is the Son of God. You know, he would have a chauffeur. He would have butlers here and there. And yet, when Jesus came, he came as a lowly servant, somebody who served people. You know, he owned everything in the universe, and yet he came in a simple form. So you begin to wonder, where does abundance come? You know, how did Jesus define abundance? The Bible says that the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, and yet the Son of Man, He had no place to lay His head on. So you kind of wonder, you know, how was Jesus defining abundance? He lived very simple. He lived with borrowed clothes. He preached on a borrowed boat. When He died, did you know that Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb? He didn't even own the tomb. So what was the message of Jesus trying to tell us? Maybe there's a point in which Jesus is telling you and me today that abundance doesn't always have to mean material wealth. Are you with me? Maybe abundance comes from trusting that the Lord will always provide for all your needs. Amen. That's what He showed us. Because in the very beginning, if you can see here from the passage that I read to you in Genesis, when God created the world, there was abundance. There was rich life everywhere. There were trees and fruits and plants. And the enemy, when the enemy came in, the enemy started asking the question, are you sure that it's enough? And I'll teach you four ways right now. I pray that you receive this. I'm telling you, you're going to need it this week. Can you touch your neighbor and say, this message is for you? you. Man, I'm going to teach you four ways, four lies that the devil wants you to believe. Every single time you question God, this is how the devil wants you to question God. Are you ready? All right, here's the first lie. The first strategy of the enemy is always this. He will convince you to fixate on what you do not have. In other words, to focus on what you don't have. Let's go to Genesis. It says that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. Take a, take a moment to pause there, all right? It's the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. Wait a minute. God made the serpent? Yes, He did. God made the devil. So the next time you feel like your sin is overpowering you, guess what? God is more powerful than your sin because God created the devil. And it says here that one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say that you mustn't eat? You know, that that question, did God really say, has often got me in a lot of trouble. I'll share with you one story. When I was in college, um, I had a crush on one girl. And believe it or not, when I was in college, torpe po ako. Raise your hand if you're torpe. Come on, come on, raise your hand. <laughs> so I was very insecure when I was young. I'm still insecure right now, by the way. But I, had, I, I liked this girl in college. And uh, I could not... I. I could not find the right words to tell her that I liked her. And so we would go out with different people in a group, in a barcada. And then, you know, I just sort of assumed that she wasn't interested in me because she wasn't showing any signs. And then, you know, later on, I lost interest and I moved on. And many years later, we happened to meet each other and I was single and she was in a relationship. And we got to talk, to reminisce about the old days. And then I got to tell her... Just, you know, just in passing, did you know that once upon a time when I met you, I liked you, I had a crush on you, and you know, she just smiled and she said, well, did you know that I also liked you? And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And you know what she said? The most powerful words ever. Ask me what? You didn't ask. You just assumed. Taas ang kamay ng lahat ng assuming. Asakit mag No? That's what the the scripture is saying. Did God really say? Because you might not be asking God. You're just assuming that God said it. And so this is where we are. Because if you you retract 
and, and backtrack a little bit, this is what God said, all right? The Lord God warmed Adam. This is in chapter 2. You may freely eat the fruit of every tree. Everybody say every tree. Every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see what the devil is trying to do? He's trying to twist the word that God said. And he said, you cannot eat from any of the fruit trees. And God said, you can eat from every fruit. And did you know that, just as I read a, a while ago, God placed the, set, the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good, of, of good and evil, where? In the middle. Everybody say, in the middle. You know what that means? That before Adam and Eve could get to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they've got to pass through all the other fruit trees. That means that they have to say no to every fruit tree that they pass through. I remember our two-year-old daughter, Ellie. She loves chocolate. And whenever we open the fridge and she, she sees everything in the fridge, the only thing that she's going to pay attention to is the chocolate. And I can offer every yummy treat in the ref. You want some guyabano? No, Dad. I don't like guyabano. I don't like watermelon. I don't like yogurt. I don't like buko. I only want the chocolate. You know people like that? They're surrounded by a plethora of blessings and yet they're only eyeing that one single blessing. That's the only thing that I want and I'm only going to be happy if I can grab that blessing. This is the area where we live in. I mean, think about the guy who owns a bike and complains that he doesn't have a sedan. The guy who owns the sedan complains that he doesn't have an SUV. The guy who owns the SUV complains that he doesn't have a sports car. Where will it be enough? When will it be enough? And sometimes you meet people who are so successful in life, and yet they're also the most judgmental. You ever know people like that? Are they sitting next to you? I hope not. Means ang ganyan eh, no? Yung sino pa yung pinaka-successful, pinaka-mataas sa buhay, yung pa ang unang nang lalait na nasa baba. May mga ganyan, no? It's, 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 it's hard. But let me tell you this. Let me speak this to you. The moment you keep on fixating and fixing your eyes on what you don't have instead of focusing on what you already have, let me tell you this. You will be poor and you will feel poor no matter how richly blessed you already are. Am I right or am I right? Can I prove it to you? Okay, I brought some props. Let me look for a volunteer right now. I have in here with me a check. Who needs money? Raise your hand. Who needs money? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. Oh, no, 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 sister. Stay with me, stay with me. Okay, come here. What's your name? Leia. 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 Okay, Leia, I have a check right now with me for 10 million pesos. Okay? 10 million pesos. This is a real check. I signed it. It says Brother Odi because that's my, my real name. My first name is Brother. Okay? So 10 million pesos paid to cash. You want to hold it? Okay. Now, you can, you can encash that tomorrow in the make-believe bank and they'll give you make-believe money. So, if I tell you now that I'm giving you 10 million pesos, will you receive it? Yes. Absolutely. Will you receive 10 million pesos? Yeah? But there's a catch. Of course, there's a catch. I'm not God. I don't give things freely. The catch is this. If I tell you that when you receive that check for 10 million pesos, tomorrow you won't wake up, will you still receive it? Yes. Yes? Really? You will not wake up to enjoy a single peso tomorrow. Will you receive it? Yes. I need another volunteer. <laughs> the answer I'm looking for would have been properly, probably a no, right? Thank you, sister. Thank you for being honest. But she's honest, and I love that. Because when I was thinking, you know, if somebody would give me a 10 million pesos, I'd be, say yes right, right away. That didn't work the way I wanted it to work. But then in my heart, I would say, that means that if I receive the check for 10 million, it means that I will get to live another day. Right? What is my point? Ask me what's your point. What's your point? Waking up tomorrow is more valuable than 10 million pesos. Yes. Right? So what do you do every day? Here's my advice. You wake up with a smile on your face and you declare that your day is more than enough. 
It's more than enough to make you happy. It's more than enough to give you joy. Clap your hands if that's a good place to be in. Amen. The enemy wants you to fixate on what you do not have. And meanwhile, God is telling you, I've already blessed you so much. Here's the second lie of the enemy. The enemy wants you to exaggerate God's commands. So we, he went from don't eat one fruit to saying don't eat any of the fruits. But check out how Eve answers the snake. She says, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. You know, she was correcting the lie. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And then she says, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. I challenge you. If you can read the entire book of Genesis this week and look for that passage where it says that God says you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You know what? You won't find it. It's not there. Why? Because God never said it. What was Eve trying to do? I don't know. She was trying to put one more lie on top of another lie. And isn't this what we do? Isn't this what we do when we, in our attempt to be righteous? Sometimes we project our righteousness on other people. And just because they're not obeying God as much as you do, they're not praying as many hours as you do, you try to project it on them and then you make them feel guilty and afraid. That's what we do sometimes. We exaggerate God's commands. And I got to be very careful as a leader because there's a sense in which sometimes when we create policies, especially for the feast, that we would be more, more focused on, prior, on, on policies more than people. Here at the feast, we always say, oh, serve at the feast. Serve with us. But there's a point in which sometimes people would come and, and say, I want to serve the Lord. But then there's so many steps to get to serve to the Lord. And so we try to shortcut that. We try to lessen the steps going there because we always want to prioritize people over policies. We want to prioritize loving people over the laws that we create. And, and, and this is the part where, how do you solve this? How do you solve comparing yourself to other people and exaggerating God's commands to them? Can I give you a simple story? May I? Are you still here? Yes. All right. I'm thinking of a person right now. Her name is uh, Nanay Tuding. Nanay Tuding. Are you here? Can you raise your hand and wave so people can see you? Can we point the camera to Nanay Tuding? For those of you who don't know her, Nanay Tuding joined the feast in 2007. Tama po ba? 2007. Nanay Tuding is turning 90 years old in November 15. And I just want to take this time to honor you and then hopefully use this as a point because Nanay Tuding has been serving the Lord all of her life. Not just at the feast. There was a time when she had to raise uh, some, some donors and some sponsors to build a tabernacle. You remember that, Nanay Tuding? That tabernacle in, 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 in uh, Tondo? And she had to raise that and she had to work simply because they wanted to replace the tabernacle. And she did so many things. And you know, Nanay Tuding, you see her in a wheelchair. But did you know that even up till today, Nanay Tuding serves us? Ask me how. She welcomes the people here at the feast with a smile. She can even stand up. What a miracle. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Advanced happy birthday, Nanay Tuding. But what is my point? What am I trying to get at? It's very simple. Serve and love the Lord the best way that He has called you to. Maybe the Lord is calling you to be the best mother. Or maybe the Lord is calling you to be the best brother or the best sibling or the best employer. Serve the Lord wherever He's called you to. Stop comparing yourself to what other people are doing because maybe the Lord is calling them for a different thing. Focus on what the Lord is calling you to do. Be the best. Touch your neighbor and say, be the best. Be the best. Amen. Amen. Let's move, let's move. Number three, the devil wants you to assume that God is holding back something from you. Check out how, after all this conversation was being done, 
Check out how the serpent answers the woman. The snake says, you won't die if you eat that. Because God knows that your eyes will be open and as soon as you eat it, you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Wait a minute. The serpent says, you will be like God. Didn't God already say that we're like Him? The Bible already said that God created us in His own image and likeness. What is the devil trying to prove today? He's simply trying to say that God might be holding back a blessing from you. See, the truth is, whenever we focus on what we don't have, we're only focusing on the burdens. We're not looking at the blessing. But meanwhile, God is consistently shouting to you that, hey, you're already blessed. And sometimes you would realize, and this comes as a shock to me every time, that whenever I'm praying for a miracle, God would often show me the miracle, not in a new form, but a miracle that I'm already holding in my hands. Have you ever had that experience? Can I show you a little video to prove my point? All right, let's show the video. Seeing my dad, he forgot his phone at home. All right, Karen, I'll be right back. See you in a little bit. All right, I'll see you later. Where is it? Where's what? My phone. You just sent me a text saying that I left my phone at the house. I texted who? Joe, look. You just sent me a picture saying that I left my phone at the house. I texted you? It says it right here. You left your phone at home. Which phone? This phone. <laughs> How many of you are like that? You're absent-minded. That's what we do. We complain. And yet we don't see that we're actually holding the blessing already. The devil wants you to assume that God is holding back a blessing when in fact, in reality, you already possess that blessing. Amen. I pray that somebody here opens their eyes to see how you're already blessed. In fact, tell the person beside you, you're already blessed. You just need to open your eyes to how the Lord is blessing you. Here's the last one, the last strategy of the enemy. The enemy wants you to think that God is playing favorites. And guess what? You're not the favorite of God. I want you to fast forward right now to a time when Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. And the Bible says when, we, when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. And when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And here's what God did. The Lord accepted Abel in his gift, but he did not accept Cain in his gift. And this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. What is the story trying to tell us? That God preferred Abel more than Cain? Maybe God was a carnivore. He liked lamb chops more than salad. Because Cain offered crops. Abel offered lamb. So was God preferring one over the other? You know, let me teach you this. Many times, Bible authors love to put and insert little ambiguous gaps in the story. Why? So that it would mirror our own human existence. Let me show you the example. How many of you have ever prayed for something, and God did not answer your prayer, but instead answered the prayer of somebody else. Raise your hand. Has that ever happened to you? You're smiling at me. I know it's happened to you, even if you don't raise your hand. Perhaps you've been praying so fervently for a child to have for your family. You have no kids, and you've been married for seven years. But meanwhile, God answers somebody who has two kids already, She's got three now, and still you've got zero. Why is God blessing that other person and not me? Or maybe some of you are praying for a business, for the Lord to help you succeed in that business because God knows you've been putting in your hard work, but it's not succeeding, and you've been opening businesses left and right. But meanwhile, God is blessing that other business. Why is God continuing to give you the business that's bankrupt? 
and the other people, the booming business. Does this feel familiar to you? That's what Cain must have felt like. Why is it that you're blessing my brother Abel and I'm giving you an offering? See, here's where scarcity comes from, the scarcity mindset. Scarcity mindset is when you think that there's only one blessing. But that's it. And because there's only one blessing, I'm going to kill my brother for that blessing. I'm going to grab that blessing. I'm going to steal that blessing. That's scarcity mindset. You know what the abundance mindset is? Ask me what? A little louder. Ask me what? The abundance mindset is where you believe that in God's storehouse, there is no shortage of blessings. Amen. Amen. Shout amen. Amen. Never assume that because there's only one blessing, because the truth is there's enough blessing to go around. And sometimes you don't get what you pray for simply because, I want you to think about this, you need to ask three questions. How many? Three. Three questions. The first one. Maybe you need to ask, is there something that I need to do? That's the first question. Because when Cain encountered God, you know what God said to Cain? He said, why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. Cain was only focused on God blessing Abel. So he was probably asking, Lord, why are you so unfair? Why are you blessing my brother more than me? Is he better than me? Do you love him more than me? See, that's the scarcity mindset. But what if you shift that? And instead of looking at it from that perspective, you start asking, Lord, is there something that I need to do? Maybe you need to teach me how to make a better offering just like my brother. Lord, what is, it, what is, it, what is in me right now that I need to change so that I can be open to the blessing? Is there something that you need to do so that you can open your hands and be ready for the blessing? Here's the second question. Is it the right timing? I love this point. Is it the right timing? How many of you believe that God has a different timing than your timing? Raise your hand. He does. But sometimes in our attempt to be so impatient, we love the Lord to bless us right here, right now. And I know that the, there are people that we're so envious about. And it feels like the Lord is blessing other people more than me. But if you truly believe that the Lord has His own timing, it will not matter if God is blessing other people. Why? Because you can declare, Lord, I'm next. Put your hand over your, your chest and say, Lord, I'm next. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, Lord, this person is next. Amen. That's the second question. Is it the right timing? Here's the third question you need to ask yourself if your prayers aren't being answered. Is there something better for me? Whew, I love this. Is there something better for me? If only Abel could have recognized the fact that there was more than enough blessing to go around. But you see, a lot of us, whenever God removes something from your life, it feels like God is punishing you. It feels like God doesn't love you. And so you begin to ask yourself, Lord, why are you so unfair? But did you know this? Let me speak this to somebody here right now. And you feel like the Lord subtracted something from your life. I want you to know that God is not a subtraction God. He's not a subtracting God. He's an addition God. He likes to add things in your life. Because God is not in the business of removing things. You know what God is in the business of? Ask me what? God is in the replacement business. Some of the greatest blessings that you will receive, my good friend, is when God removes something from your life. Why? So that He can replace it with something better. Because God knows what you need. God knows what you need. And maybe you're broken right now or you're hurting. Or you're in pain because you lost something. I want you to believe and declare with your own heart. Right now, put your hand over your chest and say, God is going to give me something better. Say it louder. God is going to give me something better. Because He's not in the removing business. He's in the replacement business. He'll give you what you need.
And when God gives you what you need, I guarantee you it will be so much better than what you planned, what you envisioned, what you dreamed of, because God is good. Amen. Stand up to your feet as I close. Our series is entitled Plenty. Everybody say plenty. How to live in God's radical generosity. But it's hard. I mean, in real life, we go through shortages. Have you ever gone through a shortage? Some lack in your life from time to time? Maybe you're like me who goes through shortages every day. Who always wonders, is this going to be enough? I want to close by reading to you one passage that St. Paul wrote to the people of Philippi when he was thanking them for their generosity in building the churches that Paul was planting. And some of you, you might be familiar with this verse. It's from Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And it says, he promises and declares to the people of Philippi, he says, and my God will meet all my needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Can you say that with me? Put your hand over your chest and say, and my God shall supply all my needs. Say that out loud. All my needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. I want you to pay attention to those words. They mean so well, right? When you say it over your life, it means like God is going to provide for you. But I want, I want to point out those words. It says, He will meet all my needs according to where? According to the riches of His glory in? Wait a minute. God is going to supply my needs. But it will not be according to to the level of my need it will not be according to the level of my giving but it will be based on the level of his generosity now what kind of generosity is this he says put that on screen according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus how rich is God is God rich he is he owns everything. But He says that He will bless you according to the riches of His glory. Where? In Christ Jesus. The way I see it, you will be richly blessed if you've got Jesus. Amen to that. Abundance is found in Jesus. And when you think about abundance, my goodness, there is no lack in God's supply. There is no lack in God's supply. And I declare this, that for those of you who are experiencing an emptiness, a shortage, a lack, I declare that when you have life with Jesus, in your season of empty, God will be your source of plenty. Amen and amen. This is your word, Lord. Open your hands, everybody, all over this place. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for this message. Thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. That through him, we are abundant. We don't have to have the best of everything. We just have to thank you for what we already have. And we thank you that we have your son and that we can walk with him every day and experience life experience love experience purpose you are more than enough oh Jesus come come and fill our hearts today come and fill our lives with your life we declare you you as our king in Jesus name Amen
I offer with my full trust and my full love. And I believe you will bless me more so I can give more. In Jesus' name, Amen. It is so beautiful to be in the presence of God. And can we pray right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want you just to lift up to him all your needs, whatever you're going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're coming from. He knows the burdens of your heart. Just, just bring it up to God and say, Lord, I surrender everything that all hurt and all pain and all worries and all fear. Lift them all up to you, Lord. I surrender them to you. You are my king and you are the center of my life. And I trust you and I know that you are blessing me right now. I receive your love. I receive your joy. I receive your peace. I receive your healing. I receive your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Live a fantastic life.